this week on the Back Table Podcast. A lot of guys go into this thinking, and gals, by the way, go into this thinking that it's too risky. Well, if you and what you bring to the table, if you can't bet on that, in my opinion, you can't bet on anything. And when you look at, like I did for months, trying to figure out what the right option was, I made an educated guess that what, what would be the best outcome. And it was based on a lot of facts and some speculation, but ultimately, you have to trust your intuition. You have to say, at some point, I got to jump because if I stand here, I'll never do anything. And I'll be 15 years later in the hospital complaining about getting called in for a two o'clock Saturday Thora, right? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things IR and endovascular. If you're a regular listener, welcome back and thank you for tuning in. This is Aaron Fritz and I will not actually be your host today. We do have a great episode set up for you and I will be introducing our guest host, Dr. Lincoln Patel in a sec. But before we get to that, let's take a moment to thank our sponsor, RADPAD. RADPAD was developed by physicians for physicians, clinically proven radiation protection during CINE and digital subtraction and geography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RADPAD radiation protection shields for all of your floral guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information. Contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and no-brainer radiation protection cap. And let them know you heard about it on the Back Table Podcast. Lincoln and Tim, do you guys do anything special for radiation protection or do you use the RADPAD materials? What's radiation protection? <laughs> uh, I, I don't particularly. You know, I just try to minimize my floral. I, I use such little floral for vast majority of my cases and then... When I have longer cases, I make sure to use the shields and and so forth, like and and lead glasses. But other than that, I truly do not use much fluoride in most of my cases. Yeah, so and, and you know I say that in jest, but um, uh, for radiation protection in the hospital, we had significantly more available. Uh, obviously, wear lead and leaded glasses, and um, that's critical for for your kind of closest skin dose. But if you have a shield, obviously, it's the best way to go. In the in the OBL, we don't have. I uh, don't at this time don't have a, a shield. So it's just minimizing your, your, your dose and the, your time on flora for sure. All right. So everyone, um, I'm welcoming today, uh, Dr. Lincoln Patel, who's also a fellow I, IR here in Dallas. Um, and, uh, he's going to introduce our, our guests for the, and as well as our topic, uh, Lincoln, I'll let you take it from here. Aaron, thanks so much for letting me co-host your podcast. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so today's podcast is about uh, going from a hospital-based IR practice to the outpatient lab practice. So historically, uh, back in the late 2000s and uh, early 2010s, there were significant payment cuts to cardiology and vascular surgery imaging and professional reimbursements. And it drove a lot of the cardiologists and vascular surgery to become employed by hospital systems. But it also created a separate uh, system for people that were more entrepreneurial and pushed them into creating the outpatient lab uh, format that we're seeing really proliferate throughout the United States. And according to the Outpatient Endovascular and Interventional Society, there are about 350 to 500 OBLs in 2014. And currently, there are now more than 700 labs operating in the United States. And the number is expected to continue to grow uh, with the continued push for more cost effective use of healthcare dollars. So with that, uh, today on the Back Table podcast, we have uh, Dr. Tim Yates, who is an interventional radiologist who has recently made the transition from a hospital-based practice to an OBL setting. Dr. Yates completed his fellowship in 2014 from the prestigious Miami Vascular Institute. Uh, following his fellowship, he remained on staff with the Miami Vascular Institute and has recently, in September of 2019, transitioned to the OBL marketplace, uh, joining Palm Vascular Centers in South Florida. Uh, Palm Vascular Centers were founded by Eric Rogers in 2010 and currently operate six OBLs in the South Florida area with a seventh center opening soon. Uh, They currently have five IRs on staff, including Dr. Yates and one vascular surgeon. So today on the podcast, we want to discuss with Dr. Yates the reasons and challenges of him moving into the OBL market. What has been his early experience in the OBL marketplace? And is the grass really greener? And after looking back on what lessons can be taken from his experience that other IRs can make, uh, in making the same transition, what can we learn from him? So Dr. Yates gave a talk at SIR Learn, which is a lower extremity arterial revascularization in October of 2019, about the transition to the OBL market. So joining us from South Florida, where he lives with his wife and three daughters, 
we have Dr. Tim Yates. Tim, welcome to the Back Table Podcast. Aaron and Lincoln, it's really great to be here. It was quite an intro, and uh, it's really an honor to be part of this. It's a great program that you have, uh, and I really think that this is the the way that we should uh, continue to um, consume uh, and promote education. Uh, just a, a little tidbit, I want to make sure that for the listeners who don't know who I am, uh, you may have seen me at meetings, you may have heard of uh, the uh, sort of the Twitter handle, Instagram work that we do with, with Sobe Vascular or South Beach Vascular, which is incidentally the name of my company. But um, I, I did actually, I did do my fellowship um, at the uh, Miami Vascular. Institute, but did my radiology training and subsequently worked at uh, Mount Sinai Medical Center, Miami Beach, for four years after I did my fellowship uh, in interventional radi- radiology at uh, Miami Vascular. And um, uh, and then, and you know, subsequently over the last really four and a half months, I've been working in the OBL. So I'm very early in the process. There's still a lot of learning happening. Uh, but one of the things I really want to hammer home for the listeners is the, the grass is, is not greener anywhere it's just grass and it's the location of the grass is it a big field that you can see with your eyes or is it spread out a bunch of months a bunch of concrete um and and so i think it's you know do you want to cut it with a lawnmower you want to cut it with shears um every challenge that comes i think you have to have your eyes wide open about what it really is and this is certainly not a move for everybody yeah so tim i think you laid out very well the frustrations of a hospital-based practice uh in, in your talk at learn including you know Patients' uh, waiting time, uh, hospital administration uh, poorly coordinated and disconnected, your talents not being utilized, and limited growth for your department. You know, but this is a common frustration many of us IRs have. So what was the impetus that finally caused you to say that's enough? And additionally, as you said, it's not for everybody. What are the characteristics that made it, you know, viable for you? And which characteristics do you see for other IRs that would make them successful in the OBL marketplace? Well, you know, I, I think for, first and foremost, you have to ask yourself, do you have an entrepreneurial mindset? And for us as physicians, you, the two of you uh, and myself included would probably agree that most physicians, at least certainly in prior generations, were were not business savvy at all. And I don't purport myself to be business savvy, but certainly we're now living in a world where social media is probably the first method of communication that we all have, whether we like it or not, for better, for worse, and for the you know botched messages that we see out there. It's it's sort of um, it's in your face, and you can uh, monetize things significantly differently now. So I think it really is it behooves us as the current generation of physicians to understand that and really do better, more timely, and more uh, up to speed medicine for our patients uh, to bring what is the most you know the foremost to them. So, um, you know, you mentioned it I, I, at the hospital. Um, it's an older model. Um, it's a big machine. It's a big uh, organization, which has a significant benefit for certain people, uh, for certain uh, physicians who really aren't entrepreneurial minded or maybe don't understand the business or don't understand what billing is or even how to market um, or how they can sell themselves and, the, and their their services to, to the public. So for some of them, if steady income, if security of an organization, or at least the appearance of security is important, well, then maybe they're sort of less risk, uh, risk, risk takers or more risk averse. And so they consider that 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 mentality is going to, you know, be more useful for them. I think for some people, actually, that might be potentially a riskier uh, approach, because at the end of the day, you really are giving away a lot of your control. So I think if you're entrepreneurial mindset, if you have an idea that you want to bring the office uh, up, up for your patients. You've, you you know you, you want to paint the walls your color. You want to put your photos on the wall. You want to put your paintings on the wall. You want to have your music uh, in, in, the, in the waiting room. If you want to be able to sit down with your patients and talk to them about your practice as opposed to someone else's practice that you're just working within, that, that's something you have to consider. So, um, you know, I, I, well, there's several good examples of, of uh, outpatient and outpatient uh, offices, bad examples too. Um, you know, there's the, the monster in the room is that, you know, and the truth be told, atherectomy has changed the way that business could be done in the office and really helped a lot of, uh, offices to stay afloat. Now, is, does that mean that it's the only modality and the only, uh, effective method of, of getting uh, remuneration? Of course not. We have a lot of things we offer, particularly as radiologists, things that we're exploring, you know, like the Curtis Andersons of the world, former partners of Bill Julian, who's doing outpatient Y90 down here successfully. Uh, we're currently, Warren Sweet and I are currently building an, an office-based Y90 program as well. I think we have to explore what the horizons are and figure out how we can push the envelope and figure out what the market actually needs because there are tons of unmet needs out there. And they're, they're good. You know, you should be 
able to be compensated for what you're doing, but you don't have to steal either. And then you can do the right thing for the patient without feeling guilty about having to pay the bills. That's a great introduction. So the question is, the biggest fear is financial for most people. Uh, So what is your compensation? You don't have to give us exact dollars. Was it a significant pay cut in percentage wise? Uh, And what is the upside and do you have ownership in your current practice? Okay, lots of good questions. And if if I... um, if I don't answer them directly, feel free to cut in and re-ask because um, it's sort of several questions there. And I want to make sure that we get to all of them because they're all important. I think number one, um, your greatest commodity is yourself. And the, the 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 best marketer for you is you. So I think you really, truly, if you're going to consider this, you have to look at what risk means to you. Um, if you know what your skill set is and if you know what the market looks like and what the options are available – people who are currently in that market, people who are outside of that market. And if you have a feeling, if your intuition tells you that this is the right move for you, it's going to take grinding and work. It's not going to be pretty. And you are going to have significant resistance to making changes, particularly when you see it as an upside for you. I think the really critical thing, not to get too sort of law of attraction on you here, but the truth is you really need to know what you want and focus on what you want and the, the job that you want to create much, much more than what than, than talking about what you don't want. Because if you focus on the things you don't like about your job, you're going to bring a lot more of that into focus and you're going to see it more because it's in the job you're at and you don't want it. So you have to make a clean break and try to figure out what your ideal practice is. Now, just because you come up with that pie in the sky idea, does not mean it's going to come to you right away? No. You're going to have to work for it and you're probably going to have to take a pay cut. You're probably going to lose benefits and you're probably going to have things that are going to, you're going to have to do to make that happen that you might not have even prepared for. So you have to be realistic and it usually takes more time than you think. There's no get rich uh, quick scheme here at all. So let's talk about upside. If you are an owner in your own business, uh, particularly if you're running a sole business, and I'm told uh, Lincoln that you're at least considering doing this for yourself. You stand to have a tremendous shipwreck, but you, st- you stand to have an incredible, uh, you know, uh, win uh, win the lottery at the end of everything because at the end of the day, it's yours, right? You've built it yourself. And so the successes uh, and the failures will be yours. Uh, I really think the important thing if you're starting off and really trying to go into the business of medicine is that you have to be really willing to accept that failures are only failures if you quit doing what you're doing. You have to learn from these lessons. And we, we tend to be very perfectionistic in medicine, but, and, and have in my mind, sort of an unsustainable viewpoint about how things should be done. The hours are long, the demands are high, patients are never happy enough, and you have to churn out more and more with every year that you're there. So it's really an unsustainable model. So you have to, at least you have to step back and realize that it's not possible to do that. And that's okay. And if you actually look at it that way and realize that your failures are only failures, if you don't apply the lessons learned, then they're not failures at all. They're lessons and they make you better. And you have to really look at it that way. Uh, me personally, uh, we'll talk contractually. We'll talk about the, the way I made my decision. I had probably three or four options on the table when I was looking at an office-based practice. And a lot of things are talk here, guys. A lot of people in business talk big because they want to sell you. And it's really important that you learn to get a, a BS meter because it's important, very, very important. You can get sold, sold down a river. My choices were start on my own, with the support of fi- you know financiers, start uh, on my own with a, a couple of cardiologists that are well known. Uh, work uh, with another cardiologist in a practice, or join Warren Swe, uh, who is also contracted with Paul Basker, as you mentioned. Um, and it was a it was a painful process making the decision, guys. It wasn't easy. Um, and you know, every decision you make is going to come with uh, questions about whether it was right or wrong, uh, and upsides uh, both you know both ways. Um, I chose this because I have three kids and a wife. I have child support with my oldest daughter who lives in Chicago and I've got student loans where all, you know, life happens. So the idea of, you know, taking a, you know, an 80% pay cut and not having benefits for my family wasn't possible. So, uh, in my current position, I'm not starting uh, the wheel uh, on my own. I'm not starting the train on my own. I'm moving on a, uh, onto a moving train with a successful, very ethical, honest, and great radiologist, Warren Swee. And that for me at the end of the day was what made the decision for me. Uh, additionally, you know, I was very honest with him about what I was making, about what my goals were. Um, and he said, all right, you're, you're coming in sort of higher than I had anticipated. But at the end of the day, we have our, our ideas aligned and I know that the the vision for the long term is worth it. So, you know, here's what we do. I'm really, frankly, 
not taking much of a pay cut at all. Uh, and I have no call currently, although that will change uh, in the near future for reasons we can discuss subsequently. Um, I don't have any benefits currently because I am an independent contractor and I contract with Palm. I contract with Dr. Sui uh, and other organizations in the area. So, you know, I'm all 10 in, 1099 income, so I'm not an employee. So I don't have any benefits program in that regard. So 401ks, uh, investments, those are all on me. Um, on the topic of investment, a lot of guys go into this thinking, and gals, by the way, go into this thinking that it's too risky. Well, if you and what you bring to the table, if you can't bet on that, in my opinion, you can't bet on anything. And when you look at, like I did for months, trying to figure out what the right option was, I made an educated guess that what, what would be the best outcome. And it was based on a lot of facts and some speculation, but ultimately, you have to trust your intuition. You have to say, at some point, I got to jump because if I stand here, I'll never do anything. And I'll be 15 years later in the hospital complaining about getting called in for a two o'clock Saturday Thora, right? Absolutely. So well said. Uh, the one thing I'd like to reiterate, and and you said it in a way that we, we have to learn from our failures, and that's commonly referred to in the business as having that growth mindset, is if you do not have that ability to learn from that, uh, that is something that probably is going to keep you from being successful. Uh, and, and in business, you know, as, as you said, uh, we're risk averse. Uh, business is the exact opposite, you know, and I told Aaron this the other day is like physicians expect 99% of our things to go off without a hitch and it should work every single time. Business is just the opposite. You can fail a hundred times. And if you succeed that hundred and first time, you've hit it big. And, and, and that's a difficult switch for physicians to make. Uh, but, but that's essentially, if you're, if you're doing this, you have to have that bit of a business mentality in that. In my I totally, opinion. totally, totally agree. It's a phenomenal point. And I think the Gary Vaynerchuk's, the Gerard Adams of the world who have been doing, you know, Gary V talks about um, that all that he's, he's the greatest failure in the world and his failures have made him one of the greatest businessmen in current society, but not because he's still a winner. He, he loses way more than he wins. He said he made his all of his greatest lessons. He learned down in the dirt. And I think that's really it's completely the opposite of what we are sold and told in our current education system, particularly medical education, which is extremely hierarchical, very fraternity sorority oriented. You will do what I did because I did it, not because there's logic to it. And change is the absolute antithesis of what they teach. You're not supposed to change. Well, we don't have that option anymore, guys. We're in a world where information is immediately at your fingertips and more information, by the way, than any of us can collate or understand. So you really do have to get you know, forward with the times and understand, as you mentioned, whether you like it or not, you are in a business and it, you're either being used for someone else's dream or you're making your own dream. So it's you just got to ask yourself, which one are you? And if you are honest about that question and that answer, then go forward without any regrets. You know, But if you don't ask that question or you don't know the answer, you're not making the choices for yourself. So, Tim, uh, in your talk, you also mentioned how uh, family comes first and you already stated your family situation. And uh, as you said, I'm in the process of uh, making the switch to the OBL market for my private practice job, which I've been in significantly longer than either of you young guys. Um, so this required quite a few conversations with my wife. And, uh, you know, uh, she has belief in me. But, you know, there's a little bit of strain, you know, uh, of why are you giving me the stability? How how are these discussions with the uh, with the family? A, a great question. Um, and very probably the most important question. Um, if she believes in you and you believe in you, uh, do you have children? I do, too. OK, you know, you're, you're very like me. I, I didn't have the the complete liberty to say I'm just going to do whatever I want. And if I'm going to start my own uh, lab in the middle of wherever um, and just hope for whatever, you know, just just hope for the best. That wasn't a possibility. I had to at least guarantee that I could cover certain things. And so you have to be realistic. Now, when you go to the gym, if you haven't been for a while, there's a painful, you know, soreness period when you diet, you know, you want to eat that, you know, chocolate chip cookie at night when you shouldn't be that kind of thing. This is not any different. You're, you're we're all relatively scrappy and resourceful. Y you can make it work. Um, you have to be on the same page. And, and if you're married, it's really important that your, your wife or your husband is, is your partner, not just you know, not just your, your lover, not just, uh, you know, the mother of your child or father of your child, but really, truly sort of a life 
and goal partner, because if they are, they'll understand. And if you are doing it for the right reasons, it's always going to work out some way or another. It may not be in the current venture. It might be something else. You might learn from a failure that you had, you know, what you're going to do, but you couldn't have those lessons if you didn't take the step. So with my wife, it was, you know, she, she, she knew that I was, I was relatively, you know, busy. I think we're all busy uh, as doctors and in all professions, but she knew I was busy and that I was also dedicating, trying to dedicate everything I could to do everything I could do well. So that meant more time often. Uh, but she, you know, wanted me to be successful and she respected what I do. She's an administrator for the, for the congenital heart program at Nicholas Children's. So, you know, she understands the lifestyle, which was really critical. Um, but at the end of the day, she also believed that I could do this. Um, I believed that I could do this. And so we, as a couple, you know, said, we're going to do this for our kids now because it's scary. Now it's going to be even scarier later. If you, you know, are in a position where you think that everything is Good, good enough, but you know you're not going to push the envelope and ask for any more. It's just good enough. At that point, you can get locked into sort of, for lack of a better term, complacency, and and then sort of overtaken by the fear of that move, even if you know it's the right move. So we both realized it was a time that was relatively early in the career. If we we're going to quote make mistakes, you know, better to do it now and figure it out. And that you know that was the path that I decided to take, and she fully supported me. And I love her dearly for that. And she's my greatest partner. Um, and we, we do it all together. She's actually now, uh, probably because of it, she's working on, she's becoming an executive life coach and she's planning on, you know, um, coaching medical, uh, and corporate executives on, you know, high level goals and, and, and strategies for taking the business to the next level. And she's, she's also doing that because she knows she's, you know, got a skill set from what she's done and it's time for her to go to phase 2.0. So, you never know what it'll bring. You have to take the chance. Hey, yeah. Tim, uh, give me her number when we're done. <laughs> done, done. You guys should interview her. She's phenomenal. Uh, Tim, it sounds like uh, you're, she supported your decision, and therefore, and your decision seems to have uh, supported her uh, decision to move into a new area as well. So that uh, could not be better for both of you, it sounds like. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, 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 and I mean, just to, you know, um, to try to, a lot of people are listening is going, God, you know, they're, they're right. Why have I not thought of it this way? I've been so binary about it. Well, that, that's okay. At the end of the day though, you, you both just have to realize you have to just be on the same page and you have to support each other and know that you're doing it for you. It's not, you know, it's not anybody else. You're doing it for you and it's for the better of your family. And that's, if, if you have that focus in mind, I think ultimately your decisions will, will work out even if they start with, as we mentioned, a thousand failures, that thousand and first win is a huge win, you know? So let's, uh, I'd like to go back into, you, you said you explored, uh, you had like five opportunities before you decided to, uh, uh, the decision you made. Uh, to, and I'm very interested in the ones that you said you rejected and you knew people were, you know, will tell you what you want to hear. Uh, but it may, may not be true. You know, especially there's so many people in the marketplace now from, uh, I'm sure you've gotten emails. I know I've gotten emails from, uh, you know, Modern Vascular, which advertises 800000 to a $1 million a year without call or weekends. And uh, there's other Modern Vasculars in, in addition to national IR partners. There's a whole host of companies that are looking to make money off you, essentially. How were you able to know which one was right? More importantly, how did you recognize them as not being the right fit? Well, um, so I think it's, you know, for me, I ultimately, I, I'm a gut person, very, very much a gut person, but sometimes I get stuck. I, I'm also hyper analytical. So I also will just, you know, go down a line and sort of fall in love with something. And then I'll sort of back off of it and start asking questions like, oh, but what about, or what about, or what about, what about, and then, you know, what do I feel about this? I, I had to ultimately make a list. I had to make a list of, and coming back to what we talked about in the beginning, I went into this whole process when I really started thinking about what I was going to do. I made myself a list of what I wanted in a practice before I started really thinking about what they were offering me. And I said, I want no call. I want to live close to where I'm going. I want to have it be in a place where uh, I'm going to be working with uh, my my team of Navy SEALs, you know, that really want to to get in. They want to do complex limb salvage, oncology work, venous work, um, do the right thing for the patient. I want to be in a business where I can allow my savvy and 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 my brain power and and creation uh, to be able to you know make products or to to market or to grow the social media business. I want to be I want that to be something that will be supported. So those are you know those are four or five things that I listed on a piece of paper and I said if I don't see these things or at least the majority of these things I'm going to say no. And that actually made it 
very easy for me because we can get, again, analysis paralysis from all of this going so many options, so many options, so many options. And, you know, X person has, you know, a good reputation and you know they do, but something tells you it's not the right fit because it's the wrong location or it's the wrong time. You, you have to listen to yourself. Um, and if you if you make the wrong choice, it's important that you just you make the choice and you acknowledge it and then you have a strategy to get out of it. Um, one of the options I kind of got, um, you, you know, I guess if you're, you're asking yourself, you bring up, uh, how do you decide who, who is really bringing what they're saying to the table? I mean, look, if you, I, I, am a photographer, I, I'm a guitarist. If I, if I'm, you know, playing a Paul Reed Smith guitar and some guy comes up with a rinky dink broken guitar and he tells me that he's the best guitar, you know, maker in town and he puts the guitar in my hands and I play it and I say, this is garbage. I know, right? So you have to educate yourself on what the strings feel like and what the headstock looks like and how in tune it is and what the humbuckers sound like when you're playing it on the amp. You have to know those things. So it can be a little bit um, overwhelming early on for a lot of us who don't have that experience, but there are plenty of people. And that's why, you know, Aaron Lincoln, you guys putting on this podcast, this is just opening up a dialogue and a conversation with people and trying to give, you know, people more resources. And it's it's available. It's The, the thing is the YouTube's, the Instagrams, the Twitters of the world, it's immediately available everywhere. So we don't have to reinvent things now. We can just learn from what other people have done. And I think what you're doing is a great thing here. And I think, you know, everyone reach out to anyone on this podcast. We'd be more than happy to talk about our experiences uh, and and failures and successes and and help help grow together because we really should be, we really should be doing medicine 3.0 at this point. We should be doing it for the better of of our patients, right? We should have a better model for them at the end of the day. And we should benefit from it. Absolutely. Because we're the ones putting in all the work and we put in all the time and education, but everyone should win from it. It shouldn't, no one should be losing. Everyone should win from this. And that's, that's really what I hope to do. Uh, agreed. And so where, what, uh, structure do you have? So you're, yeah. So, so the way that it's structured, I actually, my contract is actually with Warren Swee and his okay. practice. Okay. So, so okay. Warren, just, I'll just, we'll just give you a little background. So Please. hopefully we can make some sense of it. So Warren um, and Curtis Anderson were partners with Bill Julian, who's really Bill and Jerry Grubbs were kind of the two really big early guys in South Florida have been instrumental. And I give my, take my hat off to them and applaud them for all the work they've done in getting really favorable legislation for the office based practice, the ambulatory, ambulatory surgical center, uh, and really the, bringing the entrepreneur into the office. So I got to give them credit. So Warren was partnered with, and, Cur and Curtis Anderson were partnered with Bill, and they ended up going their separate ways. And, and, and Warren uh, basically went in and, and, and opened up his own office in Delray and, and uh, had several other little hospital things that he did to sort of pay the rent, right? And uh, it was slow going, as it often is. This is usually a nine to 15 month practice to get up and running if everything goes right. So you got to have that period in mind. Um, but ultimately, as he was in the market and, um, you know, things were, um, apparently, um, things kind of just came to a, to the perfect, uh, storm, uh, and his conversations with the folks over at Palm Vascular and they decided to partner. And so, um, that really catapulted him and it just kind of, I think gave him more, uh, more bandwidth to be able to do what he did. And, and again, you know, use the, um, the structure that Palm had, but also frankly, to bring to Palm a whole other level of legitimacy with the physicians now and, 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 um, and what was going to be available going forward in the future. And he's absolutely killed it. So when I talked to him, you know, he's got his own, he's his own company. It was much like mine, mine's, you know, South beach vascular PLLC. So I contract with, with Warren and because he's, you know, he's got ownership and, and, and Palm and things ultimately in the secondary sort of, you know, allegiances are with, with Palm, but directly to, to Warren. So, my my week looks like basically I have uh, we have two offices right now, uh, one in Delray, one in Hollywood, Florida, with a third that's going to be built in West Palm Beach, uh, all to, to do see patients and to, and to do cases. I spend my Monday at the Delray office doing cases, seeing visits. Wednesday, I'm at the Hollywood office doing uh, cases and visits. Uh, Friday, we have our office in West Palm where we see patients only until we have the new office uh, built out where we'll be doing cases up there as well. And Tuesday, Thursday, uh, really at this point is uh, for me to do uh, marketing, which we do, uh, which we're doing uh, really a, a lot of, which is going to be a fun part to talk about here, but also to do uh, sort of hospital cases and some of the smaller uh, facilities that we, you know, have arrangements with um, to do some cases over there. 
Uh, you hit on a lot of great things, and I want to hit a little bit more detail about several things. Uh, what modalities do you have in each of your centers, and, and what is your case mix uh, like currently? Great question. Um, so we have uh, a mobile ultrasound service that we uh, we offer not only to our offices, but uh, podiatry, uh, primary, uh, and other cardiology offices in the area. So I read everything for uh, Sui and I. I read all of our vascular studies. Okay, so tip, we're talking carotids. We're talking lower extremity venous. We're talking upper extremity venous. We're talking aortas, lower extremity arterial, uh, iliac, uh, cable, uh, venous, uh, renal arteries, all that kind of business, the co- very conventional vascular ultrasounds. Um, we don't have an imaging center currently, although there's been, there's some talk. In fact, at the Delray office, there's an imaging center across the street that now, uh, may have an opportunity for us to do, uh, CT guided, uh, uh studies, uh, and, and biopsies procedures, et cetera. Um, in the, in the office, we have two rooms, one, which is really kind of a, uh, at least the, the Hollywood office, we have two rooms, which one is, uh, really kind of a storage room, but we use for venous cases like, uh, RF, uh, ablations, uh, phlebectomies and that kind of a thing. And then we have our room with the CRM where we do all of our other uh, procedures. Um, in terms of, uh, case mix, uh, we do a, a very, you know, heavy arterial. Um, a lot of the bulk of what we do is CLI, um, tibial, tibial, pedal, pedal plantar loop reconstruction, um, all in the office. Um, we do have, you know, the, the, the typical iliac and SFA work, although it just tends to be slightly less. Um, but we obviously see it, uh, with our CLI patients. Um, we also have, a uh, a deep vein uh, service that uh, you know I, at Mount Sinai I, with Bob Beasley really built their DVT program uh, and their thrombectomy thrombolysis program and their uh, iliocaval reconstruction program and so th- that's one thing that I'm working on building for us here too is doing more post thrombotic cases. Um, obviously, there's some economics that come into that when you're talking about multiple stents and um, you know what your thrombectomy options are. So you know case selection is going to be something that's really, 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 really crucial for what you can do in the office and what you need to do in the hospital. And that will come into later. I think if we you know, talk about complications, but, um, we do a few RF ablations, uh, ev- you know, a day, uh, ports, things along those lines, dialysis, catheters, uh, fistulas, declots. Um, and you know, I, I am working on again, augmenting the thrombectomy that we do. I, I've been a big, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, aspiration thrombectomy user, um, uh, and have really, has really changed the way that I deal with acute arterial ischemia, acute embolic arterial ischemia, uh, as well as DVT. And so, you know, there's some cost issues with that, but trying to bring in more patients to sort of cover the cost of some of those devices. Um, aortas and carotids, uh, we do diagnost- diagnostic carotids, but we don't do stents. Obviously we don't do aortic uh, endographs, um, in the, uh, in the offices or all hospital-based cases. Um, and Yeah. Uh, no, excellent. Um, so questions, a lot of PAD, you know, and PAD is clearly the uh, financial driver for most of these, most of these OBLs. Uh, as a graduate of Miami Vascular, I have to assume you had a lot of PAD experience. I finished my training in 2003 when we still did a significant amount of PAD in IR. Uh, but more uh, newer training, uh, and especially the big academic centers, really don't have exposure to PAD. It's been mine and, and the numerous people that I've hired. Uh, how do you think the younger guys, uh, besides the learn program, uh, where can they develop the skill set if they want to go to the OBL market and, and what do they need to make sure, uh, they can do, or they, they feel comfortable doing? Uh, good question. Um, because if you're going into business, you have to know where the business is and you have to be able to, to do the business. You have to be able to cover your costs. You don't have to be unscrupulous. You don't do atherectomies in people that don't need them, right? There's certain, you know, certain patients that I won't do atherectomies, right? There's certain patients that I won't stent. There's certain patients I won't intervene at all. So you have to have, you have to have, you have to use your, your ethical approach to treating patients is, is number one. Um, but, uh, you know, for, for guys that are going to, and gals that are going to go out there and try to learn PAD and practice, it can be a little scary. Um, I do think that there has to be sort of a, a vetting period where you, you need to go to courses uh, that use industry. I, I can't hammer this enough. Uh, a lot of docs, particularly in academic programs, get the sort of voodoo doll kind of approach to industry, which I think is absolutely crazy. You don't have to be paid by them, but you also shouldn't shun them because at the end of the day, you know, innovation is happening with industry. Now they may be pushing products to you that you don't really think work. And some of them don't, but industry is where we're seeing technology advance. And you as a physician can actually 
significantly influence the way the industry changes technology. Uh, and what we do is all technology. I, I mean, I think all of us here will agree that everything that we do is based on some form of technology. I mean, daughter didn't do this without his catheters and his dilating, you know, rods, right? So um, you have to really acknowledge that. And the industry does a really, really great job of finding key opinion leaders and really skilled people who are doing a lot of cases to put on courses for you to see how these things are done. So you really need to go to these things because most of the the big companies will put on, you know, uh, a, a two or three person sort of master class where they'll talk about obviously some of their product portfolio, but they'll 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 prevent uh, present excuse me cases uh, by the operators talking about specific strategies and specific case ideas, um, and a lot of them are also coupled with cadaver labs. So if you've never retrograde punctured a perineal artery or even a dorsalis pedis with ultrasound or fluoro, you actually get a chance to learn it. Like Jihad Mustafa, Fadi Saab, George Adams, uh, Craig Walker. Uh, a lot of these guys, cardiologists, uh, Su- Dr. Sui, my partner, does a lot of these. Uh, Bob Beasley, my former partner at Mount Sinai, does a lot of these courses. They're everywhere. So you need to ask your reps, where can you train on how to do you know, CLI work? So that, that's, a fir- that's a first place. Um, ask, your, ask your colleagues who are doing the cases, can you come observe? Don't just swallow your pride and go. Get on Instagram, get on Twitter, get on LinkedIn. There are a lot of cases that are being presented there. And while there's the pros and cons of social media, and presenting cases, you know, you get a lot of the sort of people doing the self-marketing and just showing the home run angios, which isn't really the whole story. There's a lot to be learned there. And there's a lot of technology uh, and unfiltered stuff there that you can say that you can't say anywhere else. So I think if you're going to learn PAD, uh, you get you want to you want to feel confident that you understand the concepts. And then when you start in practice, the next phase, be very measured about how you do it. And it's OK to say no. You should say no, and you're probably your greatest tool is the word no in many scenarios. Even now, when you're an advanced operator, um, figure out you know what your strategy is for bailout because you always have to have one because things go wrong. They go wrong statistically. So if you can't fix the complication, you should early on try not to cause the complication. And if you can't do it, you know don't do it. If you are going to have the potential for complication be really, really, really close with a surgeon that can help you fix the problem. I mean, I think those are, they may seem inherently obvious, but if you don't have that mix, you don't want to get yourself into trouble that you can't fix. That's, I think that's a really honest sort of first step. Yeah. For, for new people, um, I, I think that'd be, it, it's a challenge. Uh, and it's not necessarily the technical skills because I think they can develop those fairly rapidly with the resources that you mentioned uh, from the courses and so forth. It's uh, what I've seen is the management side of when and how to do things are where they need uh, uh, some guidance. Uh, and if you don't have a mentor that you can ask, you know, that would be ideal, of course. Uh, but if you don't, I, I think that's where this, these SIR forums are really helpful. Uh, people are, you know, willing to give you opinions like uh, wh- what you should do and so forth. So I, I think that would Absolutely. be a great thing. Absolutely. Go, so. go, to the, go to the learns. Go to the uh, – the other thing I would say is – you know, go to vascular surgery meetings and go to cardiology meetings. Um, as as radiologists, um, if you all you do is drink one type of Kool Aid, all you know how to taste is one type of Kool Aid, and it's all Kool Aid, right? It's just you know, there's purple, there's there's orange, there's there's red, but you should know what's being talked about. And you know, cardiologists in many ways, you know, they've got the wire catheter thing on absolute lockdown. They've got arsenals of things that you and I don't even know exist. Vascular surgeons understand vascular disease in a very different way because they're actually looking at the arteries exposed. There's wisdom in all three, you know, uh, uh, vascular specialties. And I think, um, I think the SIR is starting to see that. I think that a lot of the, the people that are doing like the learns for the SIR are also very, um, very busy and active in, cross uh, uh specialty meetings so i think that's also also important because uh as you mentioned management is kind of r- where that separates the you know the men from the boys or the women from the girls um you know you can do the case but what is it what what, what do you do when they come back with a red hot swollen leg from the revascularization and they have compartment syndrome what do you do if it's just reperfusion edema they don't need a surgery what do you do when you know a wound is stalling after three or four months i mean those are the real questions and that's that's time. That's attending meetings. But I think the available, I think information is available. I think you just have to seek it out. Yeah, that, Tim, that's a good time to plug the outpatient endovascular and interventional society uh, meeting that happens every year that involves cardiology, vascular surgery, and IR. And um, I went last year and met some local 
vascular surgeons who have been very helpful in my, in my practice. So super uh, critical. Good, great, yeah. great point. And, and, you know, Bill Julian's been instrumental in that. And I think, uh, g- g- reach out for these things and you're going to meet people there. Um, but by the way, you know, a lot of these things, it, you are looking for knowledge, you are looking for technical expertise, but don't ever undercut, you know, just meeting people uh, and, and networking and just, you know, sit down and having a drink with someone and just kind of connecting on a personal level, because uh, you never know what will come from that. And, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're, it's a small community. Um, people are actually generally more available than you think. Um, and we should really share. There's nothing that's hidden. I mean, to think that, um, you know, an interventional radiologist can cross a tibial better than a cardiologist and a vascular surgeon nowadays, personally, and I might get shot for this when I walk out of the house, but, you know, I, I think it's silly to think that anyone has the secret, right? Now, someone will develop a new secret and it might be a radiologist, might be a cardiologist, might be a vascular surgeon, but I think using and cross-contaminating this, the wisdom should be the, uh, what the goal is, not um, hiding the secrets. Uh, let's touch back on, uh, you say you spend two days uh, a week marketing. Is that uh, correct? Yeah, um, it, more or less we spend, um, uh, the, Palm has uh, a marketing division and uh, Ross Pentland, who's the, the head of marketing, uh, and I, uh, you know, actually Warren was very uh, clear about, and Eric Rogers, I sat down with all of them individually and in groups uh, with Warren. Uh, he was crystal clear about um, what he really wanted me to do and achieve. And, um, it was on a similar line, but it was marketing. Uh, he, you know, he early on did a lot of door to door, knocking on doors, talking to people, shaking hands, um, and just meeting people to put a face with the name, because as opposed to the way it was in my old hospital, where you're always visible, you're always on call and there's only two or three people there to call, you're going to get auto referrals. You get a false sense of building the business because you're fed. Um, he, yeah, but when you're in an outpatient facility in an office in the middle of nowhere, you don't see anybody. So the only way you're going to meet these people who are sending to you that you're reading ultrasounds for that you're fixing legs for is by actually going to see them. So Warren had no qualms about it. He said, look, if you come in, you're it's going to be just like when you joined Beasley at the hospital, you're going to come in there and he's going to start to give you some of his cases, which is going to result in a decrease in cases he's doing and increase in cases you doing. And you guys are going to do the same number of cases as two people as he was doing as one. If you come in, and basically do all of my cases for me. I'll go play some golf in the afternoon and it'll be great. And I'll have some time off, but we won't be really growing. What I want you to focus on for the first six months is come in, build your practice, but go market, go and market, go market, go market, go market, go market. market. To people, it's physicians that you're marketing to. And uh, which type of physician in particular? So it isn't just oh, really? physician okay. actually. And this is something that you will find useful. And I think people should know office managers, uh, center managers, you know, the, the front desk staff, you'd be very surprised at a primary office who makes the ultimate decision for where a vascular patient is referred. And while that might be a little um, sort of uh, uncomfortable here, it is reality. So, you you know, we visit uh, we visit office managers and we talk to them about how, you know, we can uh, for ACOs and HMOs, how we can help them to decrease cost. Uh, we talk to certainly a, a broad spectrum of physicians, obviously. But, um, you know, sometimes you got a busy podiatrist uh, or a bit, not that's a bad example. Podiatrists are pretty specific who they send for vascular. But if you got a, a primary uh, or a geriatrician who, you know, doesn't really know necessarily who to send to, that office manager may be your gateway to, you know, helping to, them to build a referral stream to you. So, um, you know, we all sit down and talk with anybody that I can. And, and having an office staff know you and you making an impression on them is going to make an impression on the physician. Now, when you're talking to a physician, um, it can be a little bit uh, early on for me, it was a little sort of intimidating because there are a lot of acts in town. There are a lot of people out there and either they do or don't know who, you know, my partner, Swede, most of them early on did because I basically would just go introduce myself as the new partner, but to try to continue to sort of say, Hey, how's our organization doing for you? How's your patient care? How are they coming back to you? Are they better? Is there anything we can do, you know, to help build, uh, build for you guys. But, uh, you know, a lot of them don't have time and a lot of them don't, you know, want to hear you. And a lot of them don't, um, aren't going to give it the time of day. Um, and they, you know, they'll almost treat you as if you're selling something. So coming back to the beginning of the discussion we had with the podcast, you got to be willing to, to do something that you're not comfortable with and you're going to fail a lot. And it takes a thousand fails for that one victory sometimes. And if, if, you know, the person that quits is the one who never sees the victory. So I, I, you have to build sort of this veneer outside, uh, your, basically your, um, 
your hurt feeling radar is going to go way down. You're not going to allow anything to get to you because they really aren't being personal. They just don't have time a lot of times. So you just have to continue to go knock on more doors. Um, you know, it's kind of like being a politician in that way. Um, you have to be willing to sort of shake hands, hold babies, um, and uh, get a whole lot of no's to get that majority vote. Yeah. And uh, that's a hard thing for a lot of physicians, you know, because we're so used to thinking, well, I'm the doctor. Of course, they're going to send to me. And this idea that we're going to have to work and do a little bit of hustle for that, it's its a bit of a paradigm shift for many people. But uh, what you said is exactly right on. Uh, and uh, how about any direct uh, to uh, patient marketing, uh, especially Google search. And I know Aaron has some experience in that, uh, or do you get involved in any of the direct patient contact? So abs- abs- absolutely. Absolutely. So we, we do, um, we do educational dinners, happy hours, uh, for referring physicians, obviously, but we also, um, we, um, have been, um, uh, to a, a few in West Palm, for example, there's, um, African, African American society that, uh, that puts on, um, a meeting every year, um, and has sort of an underserved, um, population, uh, for treatment of, of, uh, uh, vaginal bleeding and menstrual bleeding. Um, and we've been very heavily involved as donors to their organization, but as, but primarily in education. And they had a, a huge, really phenomenal meeting about two months ago that, uh, both Sui and I went to and, uh, talked to them about, um, management of, of, uh, menstrual bleeding and that uterine art organization, uh, is an option for a lot of these women. And I was, I was shocked, just absolutely shocked at how few women in that particular group, you know, knew that it was even an option on the table. Um, we also, uh, are very, um, upfront and, uh, frequently educating our staff. We do educational topics for our staff because, you know, a lot of these, a lot of our staff are absolutely phenomenal. They really carry things for us, but, um, they may, you know, you, they may hear you talk about, uh, a diabetic foot ulcer and neuropathic ulcer a thousand times, but not actually know what it is. And they learn to go through the motions, but don't really understand the, the logic behind it. So we're very aggressive with them and doing that. We also have some health fairs and other things with universities, uh, younger people that we uh, have been involved with and in trying to recruit you know, new medical students and things. So we try to, you know, vary, vary it. And I think that's sort of the spice of how to do this well. That concludes part one of the hospital Obiel podcast. Please stay tuned for part two coming up next. All right. Well, to the audience, thank you for listening. We covered a fair amount of material today. If you guys enjoyed the podcast, but want more, Check out our list of 53 other podcasts at backtable.com or on Spotify, iTunes, or SoundCloud. We'll have a brief summary of the episode and links to any articles which were referenced during the show. Secondly, if you enjoy the podcast and want to support the show, here are two easy ways. First, take one second and press the subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening on. This helps platforms like iTunes or Spotify know that you, our audience, value what we're doing and are interested in getting our latest content as we're producing it. Secondly, if you are really getting value from these podcasts, please go to iTunes and leave us a short written review. This helps us in so many different ways. Plus, we love the feedback. So that wraps things up. We'll see you next time.